dress up for the occasion, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nasty pink shirt. Hey, everybody! Live from my mother's basement, we're talking about my... Nasty pink shirt? Nasty pink shirt. <laughs> Hashtag that's, that's nasty a, pink shirt. Yeah, there you go. That's a good line to start things on, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he's a man. He's a man's man. If anybody remembers that, you're already cool. Um, <laughs> so, today's episode of Live from Your Mother's Basement podcast is again with my best buddy, at Dan Talks Wrestling, you know him, the one, the only, Dan, and he's talking wrestling. Yep, you give a, how did that go? You've tried the best, now try the rest, it's Dan Talks Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been like a long day, I almost blanked on my own, uh, hey, your own catchphrase? Yeah, I think I used that once. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a catchphrase. We, uh, it's like it used to be on the old pizza boxes. Like, you tried all the rest, now try the best. It's like, but if everybody's using the same box, what does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> we got an interesting topic today, once we get past all the shenanigans. We, um, I've been excited about this for, when did we bring this up? Two days ago? Three days ago? A week ago? Something like that. Well, whatever. It's been floating around for a little bit, so we've had time to think about it. This is, um... You know, this is my background on the fucking desktop right now. I got Macho Man holding Liz on his shoulder from when he won at WrestleMania 4. And uh, essentially what we wanted to know is, well, who you guys out there would think is a modern-day Macho Man and Elizabeth kind of couple. Who could pull it off? Who's got the chemistry to do it, the charisma to do it, the, you know, the talent in the ring to do it, etc.? Who's loved as a baby face and a heel, no matter what direction they go. And we're going to, you know, spout off a few ideas and kind of argument, counter-argument each other. And please, you know, with your own comments and video responses and whatnot, let us know what you think about our picks. And if you have any other ones that are honorable mentions or think that we should have included, go ahead and do it. Um, I'm going to let Dan go first, because he's got a pretty good, uh, pretty good team up so far. Yep. Probably should have discussed this before we went on air. If you want to uh, basically start with, uh, say, the Macho Man pick first, and then Elizabeth, or both together, or I guess it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> well, these two just kind of go together anyway, I think, because they were both TNA performers at one particular time, and I think they'd really work well off of each other, but I think you should just do a Macho Man and an Elizabeth together, and we'll talk... I mean, it just makes more sense yeah. that way to me. Yeah. As you can tell, we uh, highly rehearsed this before we went on the air. Or yeah, the yeah. Or whatever we're on at the moment. This is more <laughs> more thriller, no killer. Chiller. <laughs> All filler. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No killer. <laughs> Nobody's getting killed. This is the good part of this. Um, yeah. Uh, All right, so we have, this is actually the topic that just while BSing amongst ourselves at some point or another. I couldn't even tell you when. Kind of came up with these two picks a while ago. But uh, I would go with uh, Austin Aries, and uh, if anyone remembers her at this point, Chelsea. Do you remember Chelsea's actual name or other other working name she had prior to TNA, or does it really not? Um, well, she was a model before that. She yeah. never was in wrestling prior, or I don't yeah. believe since. But yeah. Uh, Allison Skipper, I believe. Okay. I'm sure she's still out there somewhere. <laughs> well, any of you dweebs out there with the Google search engine could probably look it up, and you'll know who the hell we're talking about. But uh, if, if you watch TNA in the past two years, you know who she is. Yeah. She was hot! <laughs> yeah, she was, uh, just in case anybody wasn't watching, the uh, company Desmond Moulton has just about a, um, Probably know him better as Michael McGinnis, the Ring of Honor again. Also, uh, also escorted Ric Flair to the ring while Immortal was going on. I yes. believe. Yeah. So yeah, and actually, I believe that this liberated her contract from Wolf at one point. And, and then it never got used point, again yeah. after that. It was like a two-week thing, and then yeah, and then we forgot why we did it. I think she made, like, a cameo appearance once after that, and I forget. Hey, you were like, hey, there's Chelsea, and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I guess the first reason is why. <laughs> All right. Why do you think this? Well, as far as uh, Aries goes, um, we've probably discussed this one right over the TNA roster review that a four- or five-hour monstrosity we did about a year ago, a year yeah. and a half. Um, but he is, in my opinion, 
much the same way that Macho Man was a full package performer. He has the in-ring ability, the time, the personality. Um, briefly met him in he's always on. He's really like he just exudes this star power. Um, totally just, takes you in. Yeah. Just the whole place. I, the, the best way to describe it, I guess, is to quote Charlie Murphy uh, talking about seeing Rick James for the first time. It's like, it's like orange, uh, like aura or something, you know? Uh, I seen it. <laughs> well, no, really. Like, uh, we went to the Albany event for the, the TNA, I think it was back, like, real end of December. Yeah, and, December. Uh, I think, or yeah. 29th, 30th, 31st. Everybody in the place wanted to jump online to get that man's autograph. It was like the rock star treatment. Mm-hmm. He was wearing the sunglasses inside at night. Like, I mean, he's just, he's one of those guys. And I totally, totally agree with him on the pick. Like, if there was ever a guy that would, I could compare to a modern day kind of macho man, I think it would be him because I love him as a face. I love him as a heel. I just, no matter what he's doing, yeah. I cheer the shit out of him. <laughs> Can easily play really while doing the same character. Uh, can easily play as a face or a heel, so he has that sort and, of adaptability. And he's even good as a tweener. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Now, because obviously I'm agreeing with you on this, I can't really shoot it down. So if anybody <laughs> has a, a reason why they wouldn't say that, please share it. But I'd be I'd be hard pressed to find anybody out there, you know, who's an internet wrestling guru, you know, that wouldn't agree with that statement. But why Chelsea? What do you think about her? Well, she was, uh, I guess to go back to Elizabeth first, um, she had just kind of a different presence than most women that you see in wrestling. She never really talked, but didn't need to. She essentially was, in every sense of the word, the first lady of the ring. She had a very classy persona and a look to her. And, um, yeah. And, well, she didn't yeah, have to... She didn't have to I s- choke on my beer. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have to slut it up to get over. Exactly, and yeah. she didn't have to go over the top to get over. Right. Now, you know, Sensational Queen Sherry was a phenomenal worker and a, a wonderful talent, and she helped a lot of people as their manager. You know, Harlem Heat for one. Yeah. Um, Macho, you know, again, in a different angle when he was a heel, um, leading up to eventually the reunion of Macho and Liz and the wedding at SummerSlam 91. Uh, but when it, you talk about just a, a classy, elegant, may we say regal lady, you know, uh, there are few and far between that could hold a candle to Miss Elizabeth. I mean, she was really the, the Princess Diana of her time. You know, people wanted to just be around her, and she had swarms of fans that might not have even liked the Macho Man, but liked her wholesome kind of, again, total ladies' presence in wrestling package. If it wasn't for her, there probably wouldn't have been a whole lot of lady managers anyway, like the Luna Vachons of the world later on, but there also wouldn't have been that appeal to that you know older male demographic as well because some of the female wrestlers and managers were just kind of freak shows like sensational sherry yeah she looked good but bitch was scary and her makeup was too and it was totally different from just wearing a plain white dress or a plain gold dress you know looking hot at fucking trump's uh, palace there in atlantic city the two wrestlemanias in a row and when they really put her in, in the middle of that Macho Man Hogan feud over the belt and over the explosion of the Mega Powers, you were really invested in that character and that person being torn between the two sides, you know? And they just a lot like that. You just you don't see that really in wrestling yeah. today. So and, and she did it all really without saying a word. She had basically the the reactions, the yeah facial expressions to get over the storyline, and she didn't really need to even talk, but she was still able to draw fans in well, to what was going she on. she was also a big centerpiece between um, Savage and Steamboat around WrestleMania mm-hmm. three with Georgie Animal Steel trying to, like, date her and lick her with his blue tongue and shit. It was <laughs> weird. And uh, she was such a pivotal part of the whole thing, they could never have done that without her. And the Macho Man character wouldn't have been near as hot as it was at that time without her to be an integral part of the whole story. Yeah, it added a huge amount of depth to 
what yeah. was a character with a lot of depth anyway, I think. But yeah. he definitely added a huge extra dimension to the Macho Man. Well, I guess you can say Chelsea because she's easy on the eyes. Mm -hmm. She's that brunette type that Miss Elizabeth was. Um, right. She was a classic kind of thinner, shorter lady that you could literally pick up and put on the shoulder. I think that's part of the gig is, mm -hmm. you know, they have to be a delicate kind of flowery, oh, I'll protect you kind of damsel in distress type and not like a muscular built up, I'll whip your ass six ways from Sunday kind of <laughs> chick, you know. Um, so that's really where I'm, yeah, where she, I would come she had from. A, that. Like Elizabeth, she just had this sort of classy presence to her and I think you'd use the term that Elizabeth didn't mean to slot it up or anything. And yeah. I, I think Chelsea was the same kind of way. She wasn't around very long, but from what I saw of her, she seemed to really fit that mold extremely well. And I think had she stuck around wrestling longer, she definitely could have moved in that direction. Yeah. Um, I would say yes. And I would say that Chelsea didn't really say a whole lot anyway. Right. She kind of got bossed around, finger in the face, you'll do this, you'll do that, stand over here, and it's really reminiscent of that. So I think that those two picks, whether they're working together or separately, would be a, a great pairing. And I think they would play well off each other anyway, because Aries has quite the you know, realm of wrestling background to choose from and to you know, emulate. I think that would be great. Um, as far as for me, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a stickler for the TNA product right now and in, even in the last few years. Um, it's no lie. A lot of people call me a mark or a smark or whatever, you know. Just throw the four, five, eight letter words out, whatever you want to do, but when I look at a guy like Bobby Roode, he's a complete wrestler package in the ring. He can work as a face, work as a heel. He's had classic fucking matches no matter where on the card he's been. He's put people over when they needed to be put over, he has been, an, you know, a really important part of TNA's product in the last couple of years. Longest reigning TNA champion. It's it's something like when Hogan was out of the picture and they needed somebody strong, a personality to carry the belt, and somebody that could entertain, draw fucking people in the seats. You're looking to Bobby Roode, and you're looking to the Macho Man, and they they're, they fill the same role. He's got the beard, just like him. He doesn't have the hair anymore, which, you know, is of itself maybe not so big of a deal anymore, seeing as it's, we're going to be in 2014 here soon. But uh, I think he's he's got the physique like Macho. He's around the same ring weight that Macho was in. His promos are always spot on now. I mean, I remember watching him at Beer Money and thinking, holy shit, why is this guy not heavyweight champion? And lo and behold, <laughs> you know, how are we to know? Um, you know, he's not just a brawler like his partner James Storm. He actually puts together technical moves, can do submissions, can get on the top rope and do shit. He's worked great program with Austin Aries. You know, that yeah. whole thing where he put him over at Destination X was incredible. And I loved that whole feud that he yeah. had. Not to cut you off, but that's a... Uh... Oh, well. That's me. Uh, <laughs> that's a, uh, a good point, the uh, putting people over, because that was definitely... Uh one of the sort of unsung things, I think, that made Macho Man great, that he never had a problem putting other people over. A classic example being his feud with Diamond Dallas Page I was in just WCW, that. which yep. is really what put Page on the mat as a legitimate contender, a, a top-level contender yeah. in WCW. They say um, that... and, and definitely Root fits that, and, and I think Aries does, too, that neither of them seem to really have any issue with losing when it's, it's time to lose. And Yeah. It's not the selfish politicking, yeah. all for me, hooray, and shit on you kind of, you know, crap that you might get either in another company or even in another yeah. time period. You know, they're, they're real team players. And I think Macho always had the thing where no matter who was in the ring with him, be an ultimate warrior who could do all the four moves, or, you know, a guy like Hogan who he could get a good match out of for yeah. 20 minutes, or it was a guy like Jake Roberts who was also another great in-ring performer, mm -hmm. Or it was a Kurt Hennig, Mr. Perfect, or it was a, you know, guy like the Giant, even, who couldn't fucking put two moves together side by side, but because he was in there against a guy like Savage, it sold the drama. Savage had feuds with Sting and Luger and a lot of other top names, but it wasn't at the main event level in the card, even. It was, you know, still somewhere near the middle, and it was just a great match. I remember when... 
Bret Hart came to WCW, and Savage was all banged up, his knees and elbows and everything else, needed to take time off, have surgery, and he was still going out there and having competitive matches, even around the time when they were doing the, the end of the Macho Man Roddy Piper feud, and then, you know, Bret Hart beat him, and then he had the match with Piper directly after for another good, you know, five minutes or so. And he sold the, the heel in peril at that point. But, you know, it was, it was a feel-good moment. And he didn't give a shit win, lose, or draw on that one. He was just there for the fans. And I think that Bobby Roode is there for the fans. He loves the sport. And I don't think, you know, between Austin Aries and Bobby Roode, I don't think you're going to find stronger picks in either one of our books for who could fill that role. No, I don't think But so. that's mine in terms of the Macho Man. In terms of Miss Elizabeth, um, I had a few ideas. But the, the strongest one I can think of is Maria Kanellis. Um, hmm. In WWE for a while, she was portrayed kind of as a ditzy, know-nothing, you know, whatever. But on the Macho Man DVD itself, in the in the Miss Elizabeth type get-up, doing the classy lady stuff, back-and-forth banter with Matt Stryker, I really saw a lot out of her. She's definitely easy on the eyes, brunette, um, smaller build. She's not a muscular lady like... Uh, you know, a Nicole Bass or anything. That's extreme. But she's not even like a competitive Beth Phoenix, Natalia Neidhart type either. She's very slim, trim, and uh, I don't know. I can't think of another good word. But, I mean, I think she fits the bill on that. She, um, She's tan like Elizabeth was. She's not, you know, a pale little... Mm-hmm. That, you know, you believe that she's the summer fun girl next door, perfect lady, Puritan type, if she needs to sell it. Um, but then you think about Miss Elizabeth's run in the NWO with Savage, and Maria Kanellis can also play a heel. Yeah, very well. You, you don't Both necessarily I... want to put a microphone in front of her all the time, but if need be, she was great at doing the interview thing. Yeah. And sometimes Elizabeth and, was and, stuck in that role. And even in the ring, Maria is very good at portraying herself as a heel, uh, as we saw it. And the taking bumps. Show a few, uh, I guess a month and a half ago now, in, uh, yeah. June 21st. Um, and certainly what she's been doing in Ring of Honor as a manager there. Much yeah, more vocal than a class. Was, but it's, she's, mm-hmm. she's a great you know, person to, to try to put into that role, mm-hmm. and I think that people wouldn't rebel altogether to see her in that. Mm-hmm. And I think that if she was working with Bobby Roode, it would be incredible. And that, that's mm-hmm. my... You know, two and or one and one together makes two. Pick. Um, there you go. I have some other ideas floating around of who might be able to do it, but for me, that's my strongest. And I know for you, your Austin Aries Chelsea was your yeah. you know go to Top Gun kind of thing. Um, now we'll just instead of pairing them up, let's just say one or the other. You know, somebody that comes yeah, to sure. mind. Um, we're about eighteen minutes in, so. I mean, this would be kind of the tail end here. Yeah, this um, actually will probably get, end up being our shortest audio to date. <laughs> Maybe. Despite being at the 20-minute mark almost already. <laughs> um, okay, it's something. It is. Do you have anybody, or you want me to go? Or? You can go first. I have a few things. But um, I, well, I have at least one off hand. Yeah. yeah uh, honestly, I mean, because we're only doing active wrestlers now. So right. I'm not going to pick... Anybody from, you know, even just retiring a few years ago, but I was... Actually, there goes my pick already. No, oh. go ahead. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I, I was going to say a guy that has emulated Macho Man quite a bit. Um, I figured, I was I figured gonna, this is where you were going. <laughs> I was going to go with Jay Lethal, and the reason I'm going to go with Jay Lethal isn't because of just the impersonations, but because he showed me something. He showed me that he's an over-the-top, dedicated worker, and when he came to the show that we were at... He was the, yeah. the hottest guy, surprise, you know. Yeah, he was not announced for the show. He not at all. He was a surprise entrant surprise uh, at number 30 in the uh, Royal Rumble. And he got day. quite the pop. I yeah. mean, but he's been heel and face and back to heel and back to face, and people just want to cheer this guy. He's got such a connection with the fans that he could probably squat down and take a dump in the ring and they would cheer it. Like, I mean, that would be a totally different promotion, but... <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, just, I don't know. And there's where this video uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> <Train wreck. laughs> But I'm just saying, like, he's he's got the high-flying enough moves to, to pull that aspect off. He also can do all of the punches, you know, punch for punch like Savage used to. Mm-hmm. He does the back elbows. He does all the shit 
that you would need to be believable. So he's enough of a striker, enough of a high flyer, and the motherfucker can actually wrestle and chain wrestle, and it's that's a good thing to have. And I would think that if I was going to go with a number two guy, like if I wanted Rude to have his own real persona and do something else, I wouldn't have a problem looking to Jay Lethal and say, hey, this is your fucking idol anyway, like, let's, let's go. <laughs> and uh, I don't know who I would make his valet, but I think that he would be able to do it. So on that note, uh, actually I did just, this wasn't originally one of my picks, but it did kind of pop into my head. Um, another uh, wrestler who has, actually I think probably the best flying elbow in the business today. You probably know who I'm going for, right? Yep. EY. Um, hear me out, obviously he's currently a comedy character and a very good one. I, I actually enjoy his antics quite a bit. Definitely. But, uh, he actually has shown in the past that he actually can play a legitimate, serious character if need be. He, he really, in many ways, I think, is kind of a total package performer. Um, they just don't use the same vein, right? <laughs> um, if you recall, his heel run with the World Elite Stable, where he led that a number of years ago now. Um, but he actually worked very well as a serious heel uh, during that story. Um, again, he has the elbow drop. He's a very good chain wrestler, I think, and has a lot of high flying moves. He really um, brings a lot out of an opponent in the ring, and can definitely yeah. get the crowd going one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, he, he just he knows he, what the fuck to do. He definitely has that crowd psychology down. Yeah, he's like a Hogan in the ring. I swear to God, yeah. he can really get people pumped or booing or whatever he needs to do, and that's. A lot of the time now, with all the flippy flips and the bullshit, that's a really overlooked thing. People don't mm -hmm. always, you know, like, people will be like, oh, Bully Ray is washed up and yada yada, whatever, but he's one of the better ring psychologists I've seen in the yeah. last ten years. And even using the Hogan example, I mean, everybody hits on Hogan, oh, he can only do two or three moves, and yeah. that's not necessarily untrue, but he is probably one of the best, if not the best, ring psychologist and crowd psychologist at yeah. ring wrestling. He knew how to use the skills he had at the appropriate times and had the crowd eating out of his hand for every single thing he did. He could get whatever reaction he wanted, and if he wasn't getting it right then, ten seconds down the road, he was so adaptable that he could just predict it mm -hmm. and do it. When he and Rock faced off at WrestleMania 18, I remember this so clearly, they were booing the Rock. They were cheering Hogan. That's not what Vince wanted. Yeah. And somehow, by the end of the match, they had changed it. And, I mean, there were still the, the loyal Hogan supporters, but the whole paradigm was that The Rock was the one that was going to get cheered by the end of the match, and he did. And you got to give it up for, obviously, The Rock is a talented performer, but it really was probably Hogan out there busting his ass at, you know, at whatever capacity he could it. 40 something. Yeah. To I think he was injured in that match too, wasn't he? Yes. In the uh, strain of like a pectoral. pectoral muscle, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pulled it off the. Yeah. Incidentally, Hogan actually could wrestle a more serious style if needed. He didn't really show it much in the U.S., but there are some matches he did in Japan in the, I guess, probably early to mid 90s that you can probably find on YouTube that actually show that wrestling, pure wrestling side to Hogan much more than you would see in his WWF work. So even just saying you can only do a few moves is maybe not completely fair. That's just a side tangent, though. <laughs> but, um, so we've got an Austin Aries, a Bobby Roode, a Jay Lethal, and an Eric Young. Not surprisingly, all people that have worked for DNA. Um, <laughs> just because that's really the, the main one that you and I have been watching, you know, yeah. this past year. Uh... I don't know that I could really venture out and find anybody right now that could pull it off. I mean, you've got the, the CM Punks and the Daniel Bryans, but I don't know that they're fit for that Macho Man type character or not. I think they're their own niche or yeah. whatever, and I just don't... I mean, maybe, maybe Punk. You know, I don't want to sell him short for anything because he's a talented worker and everything. And no, you know, Savage never was the number one guy. Mm -hmm. But he was definitely a number two guy for many 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 years and uh especially once you know the whole andre the giant thing kind of fizzled out like he was definitely in that slot instantaneously and uh i don't know maybe oh i'll just throw one more uh liz pick in here this is uh actually kind of breaking the rule of only active wrestlers but uh 
or a possible Miss Elizabeth type, I'd throw in uh, one of my personal favorites of all time, Stacey Keebler. You know, I was thinking that. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, she enjoyed playing the sex pot role, and, uh, well, you know, no complaints here. But, uh, <laughs> but, but if you watch some of her reactions when she was managing or, say, involved in storylines with uh, Scott Steiner and Tess, where they were kind of fighting over, which was not terribly unlike some of Macho Man's storylines. Right. Like, just some of her physical reactions and things like that. Um, non-verbal reactions were definitely in that mold. So in a, in a different world, perhaps, she could have filled that role as well. Had it been yeah. 15 years prior, maybe, I think she would yeah. have been definitely a great candidate, too, because she definitely. had the cheerleading background, she was athletic, she was thin, she had legs all the way up to her fucking chin. <laughs> she could get away with wearing a, a dress that was low-cut, not slutty, but also showing enough leg, and you would be, you know, invested in the dress. And yeah. But she didn't, again, Stacy liked to have those panty shots and all that other shit because it was just easy to get over with the crowd. Yeah. But she didn't have to do that. I mean, she was a, she was a Nitro girl, right, for a little while? Yep. And uh, yep. she that's, had... That's how she broke it. Yeah, she had other so talents. They she, used she her... She won the uh, Nitro girl search contest, as I recall. I remember when they started doing the Miss Hancock gimmick with her, even, and she was in the skirt with the... The, uh, the glasses and the librarian thing and the collared shirt and the clipboard and it wasn't it wasn't really until the end of that gimmick where it was the naughty dancing on the announce table thing but it yeah. just really seemed to fit her and she took the role very seriously and I think she did really well in it and I can't remember was she involved in the right to censor or no? No. That was uh, Ivory was the one that actually joined it and then made it the thing where uh the cat, Miss Kitty, was, like, kidnapped by them. And, right. And I think she was kicked out of the company shortly thereafter, and it never really went anywhere with her. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Keebler was kind of a, a backup pick for me, too. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I had the poster on my wall with her in the cheerleader outfit, you know, growing up. <laughs> Thanks to you, of course. That was a gift. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I just see the, the killer smile, you know, and the... Mm -hmm. And the legs, you know, for miles, and I just think, you know, that would really fit the, you know, the, the sweet lady in peril kind of thing that you would want to do, you know? Yeah. They have to be attractive, otherwise nobody's going to care, and that's a, a sick, superficial thing, but it, that's that's professional wrestling. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about some freak of nature with 18 fucking tattoos on their face, you know? <laughs> but, um, I don't know, even for me... If we're going to throw just a little more out there, I know we're getting kind of long here, but uh, I would say SoCal Val. Um, yeah, I can see that. She doesn't get to say much anymore. Sometimes she does the backstage interviews. Sort of our running joke watching Impact is uh, just picking out the random SoCal Val sightings when she almost accidentally gets caught on. <laughs> Whoa, what am I doing? But her <laughs> reactions on the outside of the ring when the wrestlers get thrown out and everything, they're priceless. She always thinks she's in danger. Yeah, she's always in the right spot to be caught there if yeah. they're if they're panning the camera, and um, and incidentally, they actually did uh, cast her for a while as the Elizabeth role to Jay Lethal's Black Machismo. Yeah, and she did well. In it. So, I, I really wish they would do more. Well, I like just something with her in general. Have her be involved <laughs> ringside with a stable yeah. or something, or yeah, a cheerleader type or something. I don't know, just anything. Get her on the TV more. You have her on the roster. Use her. She doesn't have to just be the person that holds the ring robe or, you know, gives microphones to people or whatever, like, you know? Yeah. They have her on the website for the knockouts. What does she do? <laughs> Come on. I know she's not an active competitor or anything, but use her. You know? Have more backstage segments. Yeah. It never hurts your product. Yeah, every, every once in a while she'll get, like, an interview segment on, a, like, a pay-per-view or a pre-show or something like that. It would feel bigger. And she always does really well. Like there'll always be some comment that the wrestler makes that either offends her or frightens her or something. And she's got the, yeah. the facial expression down. She's got the timing down. Yeah. She knows what to say and how to say it. Her inflection is always good. I don't know. But those are some picks for us, yeah. and you can match them up in any whichever order you want. I mean, it's not say set in stone. Obviously, we're just kind of thinking amongst ourselves who could fit this role and pull it off and. I don't know, it's a fun enough idea to think about because we really haven't seen another modern day power couple like that that yeah. really just kind of 
you know, whether for good or for bad, has the crowd, you know, totally emotionally invested in the show. I remember watching WrestleMania 7 when Macho got back with Elizabeth. It was a bigger reaction than the main event when Hogan oh, beat yeah. Slaughter. Everybody was in tears. Even the Ultimate Warrior fans that wanted, you know, Savage to get his ass whipped were, you know, the ladies were all crying. It was romantic. I remember Bobby Heenan's comment. He's like, if you like that kind of mush, like, you know. And, uh, they, they pointed out Elizabeth in the crowd before the match. You knew it was going to have something to do with the finish. It was just, it was an iconic, true, big moment in wrestling history, the wedding at SummerSlam, it was the first of its kind, I think. Um, it, they've never done it again with any sort of immense build like that, you know, because uh, yep. Macho's career was supposed to have been over, and uh, this was a great send-off thing, and, you know, you'd seen Elizabeth for four or five years at that point, and it was really a... Uh, it was really a nice payoff for the fans that had followed it for that long, and I wouldn't be opposed to seeing another kind of run like that whomever would take up the, the reins so you got anything else to add? No I guess you remember where Miss Elizabeth actually debuted right? Oh, yeah, the, the Mid-Hudson Mid -Hudson Civic Center we were there dude yep that was a hardcore um, they were playing the clips actually back to back to back with every big thing that happened there like I think uh, Andre the Giant had his hair cut there yep uh, or John or, or after Don Hogan there also. Yes. And the debut of Elizabeth. Yeah. They, WWF actually taped their uh, weekly TV show for a few years in the 80s at that arena. So. Well, it was a good one to do it at, too. So Absolutely. It made yeah. it look like there was a bigger crowd than it really was. Yeah. Um, but it filled every time. Poughkeepsie's always been a real big wrestling town because, I mean, it's just an hour up from the city via the train and people could yeah. go. Um and I guess in the old territory days, it was quite popular, too. Um, anyway, that's and, really... And, and still is, with uh, several indie promotions and... Yeah, FWE, and House I, of Hardcore. And, and actually WWE, I think, even ran a house show there earlier this year. Um, I know exactly. Surprisingly, for that small one arena. But, well, well, December but, 2012, I think that Velvet Sky got in the accident going to or fro. That, yeah. That arena. Yep. Um, but that's, that's really all we got, guys. So thanks for listening and putting up with us. And uh, maybe next time we won't have as much beer and a lot more of a plan. But I think this is a little fun thing to do. Yeah. So. And I'm actually more awake than the last time we did one of these two. So <laughs> can actually yeah. hear my uh, semi-coherent thoughts this time. <laughs> semi-coherent. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, let us know what you think. Leave some comments and whatever. And if you want to do a video response, awesome. Till next time, this is uh, live from Mother's Basement Productions, and we're both going to tag out and go watch some Impact. Later. Sounds good.